I'd like you to teach out, teach out your teaching notes. How's that? <laughs> Pick up your teaching notes. We're going to jump right in. And as we jump right in, I want you to really think about, I mean, pause. What's the greatest fear you're facing today? I mean, not some generic. You personally, your life, sitting here, what's the greatest fear you're facing? I want you to really name it. Fear of the future, fear of health, fear you'll never get married, fear the marriage will never get any better, fear for one of your kids, fear about the economy, fear about politics, fear about racism, fear about nuclear, what is it? What is it that when you get knots in your stomach, what is it when you're just driving in your car and everything's quiet, your mind drifts to something and all of a sudden you can feel the heart rate go up, the blood pressure starts to go up and you begin to fixate on things and you realize you're afraid. And we sang that perfect love casts out fear. Here's what I wanna ask you, second question. And I want you to think about this. Would you like to overcome that fear? And not, not casually, because the way to overcome it is not gonna be an easy thing. But I want you to really think and even say a little prayer to God. Some of us are afraid that one of our kids or one of our grandkids is gonna be in an auto accident or we're not gonna have enough money to live on as time goes on or, you know, we've all got fears. But Jesus said, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, but my peace I give to you. That's a promise. Isaiah would foretell, God would keep those in perfect peace whose minds are focused or stayed on him. The most common command in Old and New Testament is fear not, be not afraid. And it's usually followed because I am with you. So how do you experience God's power and presence that eliminates fear in such a way that in the midst of storms, you're not a slave to fear? Because so many of us are. In order to discover that, I'm gonna suggest that you need to understand how God has made and wired your mind and your emotions, how they work together. And when you do and when you understand that, then you understand exactly what you need to do. Because yes, there are challenging things happening in the world, but I wanna tell you how we think some of us are feeding our fears instead of starving them. And I'm gonna talk this morning about starving your fear and feeding your faith. There's a study at the University of Tennessee a number of years ago. Uh, It was not very complicated. It was a 12-year study. Uh, There was a control group that heard five minutes of a radio program with just benign information. There was an experimental group that heard five minutes of information that was all negative. You know, this, uh, there was an earthquake in such and such a city. A child was abducted in Memphis. Just five minutes. No video, just five minutes. After 12 years, they did an evaluation of both groups to find out, was there any impact of five minutes of negative audio content over a 12-year period? The results, Dr. Hatkins, Haskins discovered the people in the experimental group were more depressed. They believed the world was a more negative place. They were less likely to help others. And they believed that those things that they heard over the last 12 years would happen to them. Now now pause, think about this. This isn't like an hour of the nightly news. This isn't like a three hour movie. This isn't like in front of a screen, things blowing up. This is just, five minutes of audio. We all know, right, that you are what you eat physically, right? We all know that. You know, it's sweets today and it's hips tomorrow, right? (laughs) What I want you to get is that you are what you eat psychologically. Here's where science and scripture are in such an alignment. Three truths about our thinking. Number one, we're the product of our thought life. Who you are today is the product of your past thinkings, what you thought was true, what you think isn't true, your focus, your decisions. It's your thought life. Proverbs 23, 7. I love the King James on this one. As a man thinketh, so is he, or so you become. As a man thinks in your heart, so you become. Second, our emotions flow from our thoughts. In other words, you think and 
It triggers your emotions follow your thoughts. Most of us make lots of the decisions based on our emotions, but our emotions follow our thoughts. Scripture says, Romans 8, 6, for the mind set on the flesh is death, but the mind set on the spirit is notice life and peace. Third truth is that what we allow into our minds is the most important decision we make each and every day. What you think about, what you allow in your mind, what you watch, what you listen to, what's on the radio in your car, what's on your iPod or MP3, what you listen to, the conversations with people that you have, what you allow into your eye gate and your ear gate that seeps down into your soul, that gives you a perspective of what life is really about is the most important decision you ever make each and every day. And pause, parents, grandparents, you have no greater obligation than what you allow your kids to watch and hear. And every parent, or if you're a grandparent with a lot of kids in your house, in the appropriate kind, non-kamikaze, non-Nazi attitude, in a loving way, you need to know what's on their phones, you need to know exactly what they're watching, and you need to build a trust relationship, and you need to have certain filters. There is a world out there seeking to capture your sons and daughters' hearts, and it happens when they're unsuspecting. It happened to one of my sons in high school, and actually one of my grandchildren just last year. Something popped up, and some predator came after a little girl. Thank God her parents are very, diligent. So what goes into your mind, what goes into the mind of people you love you, is paramount. And what I want to encourage you is that what you allow to go in your mind in many ways is what is creating or feeding your fears. As you turn the page, the Apostle Paul, remember he's speaking from a prison cell. His life is very challenging. It's very difficult. And yet he has this amazing, amazing peace. He's writing to this church that he loves very much, that, that has grown and he has a wonderful relationship. They, they sent a financial gift that we'll learn about next week. And, and he's saying thank you. And as he's saying thank you, he finds out there's some disturbances and some relational conflict. And he's trying to help them live in peace, live with joy, live with love. And in the anxiety of the Roman world in a world that is filled with violence and injustice, especially for a follower of Christ, he writes to them and he's gonna teach them, this is how you can, you might underline in your notes, choose. You choose peace. It's a gift, but you gotta choose it. In a very broken world, in a violent world, in an uncertain world. He says, finally, brethren, whatever's true, whatever is honorable, Whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence and if anything worthy of praise, here's the first command, let your mind dwell on these things. I'd like to underline these key words. Underline the word true in your notes, honorable, right, pure, lovely, and then anything worthy of praise. There were about five or six classic virtues in the Greek world. He's borrowing from them, and then he takes his Old Testament theology, and what he's saying is, there's a way to think about life, but this is how God wants you to think about life, and this kind of thinking is, we're gonna learn what it means in a minute. This is what I want you to dwell on, to ponder, to meditate, to review, to fill your mind with. And then he's gonna move from their thinking to their behavior. The things that you have learned and received, heard and seen in me, Here's the second command, practice these things. Notice, they, they weren't just sitting in a room listening to the Apostle Paul. The things you learned, in other words, they had an appetite, they took it in, that you received, you actually applied it. The things you heard, they heard him talk, and you saw, they watched him model it. He says, I want you to practice the very kind of teaching and lifestyle that I had, and then very last line, he says, here's a promise. It's not the peace of God this time. What is it? The God of peace will be with you. In other words, the God of shalom, the God of blessing, the God who gives favor, the God who protects, the God who wants to give you the very best in life. Not just will he give you his peace, he'll be with you. And so here's what I wanna do. This is one of the most important messages that I'll ever get to give anywhere at any time. Because think of this. 
I don't know if the Lord's gonna come back. I don't know if I'll be here two years or five years or 10 years from now. But here's what I know about me and here's what I know about you and every person watching this. You are the product of your thoughts. And we are casual with what we allow into our mind and it is shaping your character, it's shaping your decisions, it's shaping your emotions. And if you and I would get very, very serious, he's gonna give us six words and I'm gonna define each one and then I've created a, set, a, a little question out of each one that you and I could say, if you took this seriously, before I let this in my eyes, in my mind, or in my heart, or in one of my kids or grandkids, or in my house, I'm going to ask one of these six questions. And if the answer is, this is good, it comes in. And if the answer is, it's bad, it doesn't. And here's the deal. You do that for 90 days, you will be shocked at your emotional health. You'll be shocked at the changes in your life. Because we've grown accustomed to allowing lots of stuff that disturbs your soul. Lots of lies that tell you that you don't measure up, that life is terrible, life is violent, life is uncertain, bad things are gonna happen, and then you live in fear. And living in fear is the opposite of living in faith. So you ready to go? First command is to dwell on these things. The word means to think deeply, to review, to replay, to meditate, to talk about, to analyze, to ponder, to deduce. I, uh, Colin Brown is sort of the expert in New Testament dictionary, and I love the one, he, the word is, are you ready? Listen to it, logizomai. Can anybody hear English word logic? logic? It, it's, it's, a, it's a word, he says, that's not unemotional or philosophical thought, but it's the very process of reasoning and the deduction which separates good from evil. It's dwelling on what you see, what that movie, that Netflix, what comes on the screen, the email, the blog, and asking yourself, dwell, ponder. Here's, though, the things you wanna dwell on. Number one, things that are true. This word means objectively true, that which conforms to reality, versus things that are deceptive, illusions that promise peace and happiness. I, uh, I want you to think about, okay, so what do you know is true? So it would be pondering and dwelling on scripture that's true. It'd be pondering on some truth about your life. Uh, this morning, I, I don't know if you all ever have this, do you ever just wake up and feel a bit negative and not know exactly why? Just kind of like semi-bummed out? I mean, I just taught this. I just taught this last night. You would think I would wake up chippy. <laughs> and you know, I mean, I, I laid in bed and... Um, it was early, and just this sort of negative filter. And so I, I decided I would practice this, so I prayed through Psalm 23 a couple times slowly. And when I got done, I felt slightly less negative. And then I had this thought, you know, I've gotta do these exercises for my back. Yeah, I hate to do those. And so I decided, okay, I'm, I'm gonna do that. And, and then, so as I, I thought, okay, Here's what I'm gonna do. Whatever verse comes to my mind during all my exercises for 40 minutes, I quote it out loud, passage, 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 passage. And then I decided, you know what? I'm gonna declare what's true. I am the son of the living God. I have been, I have an inheritance from him. He's already reserved a place for me in heaven. He's deposited spiritual gifts in my life. I have his peace living in my heart. He has blessed me with a wife that is loyal and loves me. And I just started to declare out loud with verses all the things that were true. And my emotions went, wow, just filled with gratitude. You have to focus on what is true. By contrast, there's lots of premises and lies that over time in our family of origin that we tend to believe. Uh, in a book by uh, Tommy Newberry, it's the 4-8 principle, it's about this verse. He, he lists some things that we tend to unconsciously tell ourselves that produce emotions that are negative and often fear. Things like, I'll never be happy again. This is just the way it is. This probably won't work. You know, if I had more money, it wouldn't matter. I would just probably worry about it. I don't have what it takes. This always happens to me. Well, the honeymoon is officially over. He doesn't love me anymore. I'm not worthy. I'm just not very creative. My back is always going out. <laughs> I like that one. I have to just accept my limitations. You know, I never say the right thing. That makes me so sick. If that happens again, I'm gonna be so, so mad. We can't agree on anything. 
He doesn't find me attractive anymore. I just don't think I have what it takes. I always seem to, to blow it when it comes, I say the wrong things. Well, I guess that's a, do you hear those things? Those are things that you and I tell ourselves. I don't measure up. This marriage will never get better. My kids, you know, my dad was like this, his grandfather was like this. I've got this addiction, I've tried hard, I just have to live with it. Here's the deal. If you think you can, or if you think you can't, you're 100% right. Ponder that. You're the product of your thought life. And by the way, this is not positive thinking. All the positive thinking, there's big elements of truth, but this is thinking way beyond what's positive. This is what's true. This is what God has said. Uh, some of the lies that you all believe, they're very, very subtle, and they're mixed with truth, like, I will be a complete failure as a parent if my children do not get into a very exclusive school and go into a profession like a doctor or a lawyer, etc. I'll be a failure. And it produces anxiety, and it produces pressure on your kids, and it produces amazing things that are super unhealthy and very dysfunctional. For many young people, they believe a lie that goes like this. My life will be a complete failure if I don't get into a prodigious school by getting all A's in all AP classes because I will bring shame upon my family and I will be a failure and therefore my life isn't worth living. And that's why we have a level of the, the I think the second highest cause of death among teenagers is suicide. And in this area, it revolves around that. I can never be happy unless I get married. I will never be happy until we own our own home. My life will be miserable unless I, it's this premise thinking, premise, 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 that some activity, some success, some upward mobility, some job, some patent, some win-then thinking, and so now you're trapped into a false belief system. Now, are those things necessarily wrong? But listen to the difference. Here's the truth. It would be nice if one of my children get into an exclusive university by the grace of God, walk with him closely, and are used by God in a profession that would bring glory to him and happiness to them. It would be nice, but it has nothing to do with my value as a parent. It would be nice if I get into one of those kind of schools and keep my grades up, but I'm going to do the best I can, but my value isn't dependent in any way on my grades, my athletic ability, or my musicianship because I am sealed and delivered and approved by the living God. I'm on my way to heaven, and he has a purpose for my life that may or may not include that. Do you see the difference? You believe a lot of lies, and your kids believe a lot of lies. And they're embedded in movies, and embedded in texts, and embedded in Twitter, and embedded in Slack and Instagram. And you have to focus on what is true, and you will see a world of difference in your life. Second, the preview question then is, when you're watching or listening to something, you ask, is this true or false? Is this true or false? I'm gonna spend the most time on this because all the others flow out of this. Here's an illustration. You think that your emotions are responding to reality. No, no, your emotions are responding to your thinking and your thinking is the perception of reality. Those people who listen to just five minutes of negative things, their perception was, you know, the guy in that car, he probably wants to hurt me. You know, never pick up a hitchhiker because, you know, I, I heard that story. It's their perception. So pretend you're out maybe on Quicksilver Trail or you're taking a big hike and as you're walking up, oh, you freeze, it's coiled up, it's a snake, and you got within, and all of a sudden, your stomach tightens up, perspiration, heart rate, oh my gosh, it's a snake, and you hold someone back, and you look at it, and you look at it, and you look at it, and then it's not moving at all, and so you get closer, and you get closer, and you get closer, and you realize it's a piece of rope that's coiled around. It was your perception that created all the exact same emotions as though it were a snake. And there's a lot of snake thinking. You, you, there's a, it takes an incredible amount of discipline and diligence to be someone who starts to think about what's true. Second, is it honorable? The word means sober, serious, worthy of respect, inspires awe. 
It refers to those things that reflect the weighty purpose of a believer's life. Now, there's a time for fantasy football. There's a time to get jacked up over the Super Bowl and other things. There's a time, I suppose, to figure out who won the Globe or the Oscar. Uh, There's a time for the trivia. There's probably a time just to relax and watch part of entertainment tonight. But there's trivia ad nauseum in the world. And this is saying, in the midst of all that, here's what you need to think about. You need to think at times about some things that are grave, sober, serious. Things like... The living God, through his son Jesus Christ, has rescued you from eternal damnation by his gift on the cross. And he loves you and favors you with unconditional love and draws you close to himself and has an amazing plan for your life. He has an Ephesians 2.10 purpose for you, that you are his actual workmanship. You're his piece of pottery, his poem. You are made and designed by the living God for a purpose that only you can fulfill that he did before the foundations of the earth. Question, am I fulfilling it? You are living in a world that's called window, time, but you're made for eternity. There is a heaven that is a real. There is a hell that is real. Those are serious things. We've had 10 or 11 memorial services in the last 30 days, and I can tell you, when you go to a memorial service and it's someone you know and you love, you get get some of these thoughts. What in the world am I doing with my life? Does it matter? The writer of Ecclesiastes says there's far more wisdom at a funeral than there is at a party. Now, I don't mean you focus on this all the time, but we're living in a world that's quick, fast, immediate. Those deep kind of thoughts shape your thinking. My wife asked me after last night's message, she said, so Chip, what what are you afraid of? I said, I am most afraid that I will squander the life that God has given me and I will not fulfill his purposes. And she said, why? I said, because at least in the world standard, I'm way more, quote, successful than I thought I'd ever be. God has given us more than I ever dreamed in every arena. And all that creates comfort and a lifestyle that works against the kind of focus and sacrifice of taking up my cross and following him and taking big risks for the kingdom of God. And so I just, I I am afraid that I could slip into a status quo type life and everyone would think it's just wonderful except the Lord would know and I would know. Ask this question, does this honor or dishonor God? When you're watching it, does this honor God? Does this really honor God? It might be gray, it might be just be evil, that's easy, but does, does this show honor God? Does this conversation honor God? Does this movie honor God? Does the book I'm reading, does this relationship honor God? Third, is it right? The word means righteous. It's used in the New Testament to refer to the Father, to Jesus, to God's actions, to God's character. It pictures doing what is right when tempted. You might write the word integrity. At the heart of this is there is a standard that's Not outside of God, but God's very character creates a standard. And integrity just means there is an alignment with that. And the question you want to ask, is this right or is it wrong? Did I just say the whole truth or a partial truth? Is this what's really clearly I know is true or is it a white lie? Is it everyone does this on their taxes and that time is coming up or is it absolutely pure? Is this I'm padding my expenses just a little because I can kind of justify it and I know and get away with it or in fact is, is, is this integrity? We really love each other but are we married or are we living together? Is this recreational, just sort of a spicy 49, 50, 51 shades of gray? Or is it just absolutely wrong and immoral and should never be in my house? Is it a game that honors life and love and warmth, or is it a game where people get blown up and I put it in in front of my kids where their thumbs are killing and mutilating thousands of people, hours on hours, in addictive behavior? Just ask yourself. 
questions. I actually took these six and I put them on one little card with these questions. Before I watch, listen, or think, is it true? Does it honor God? Is it right or wrong? And next, is it pure? This is from the same root word as holy that means to be set apart, means to be free from defilement, sexual and moral purity and thought, word, and deed. And the question you wanna ask is, will this cleanse or dirty my soul? Job would say in Job 31.1, I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I gaze lustfully for a virgin? David in Psalm 101, about verses two and three, he says, I've committed before you, Lord, to live a blameless life, and I will set no worthless or vile thing before my eyes. Can, can I just, just say something, and we won't belabor it? If you have a porn addiction, just get help. All the research is that it is as addictive as cocaine and trying hard and really intending and wanting to break a porn addiction is not something you'll probably do on your own. No one else has. And it produces fears and it multiplies into lies and cover up. And it's no less addicting than if you were sticking a needle in your arm. And it's a pseudo intimacy that will destroy your relationships. And so God's heart would be, I want, I want you to see sex as holy and pure. The Bible says God made it, he loves it, but the marriage bed should be holy. He wants what you watch, not just porn, but the kind of movies, and not just the sexually explicit ones, but what about the ones that they, they sort of suck us in by, you have this kind of mean guy married to this wonderful gal, and she falls in love with someone who's really not her husband, but he's a nice guy, and she's a nice guy, and he's a jerk, and we find ourselves rooting for them in their affair. And you know what that does? Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, seed planted. The enemy's very shrewd. The battle for your life is not out there. The battle is right here. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, but divinely powerful. And we will take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And that's why if you have a teenage son, in fact, in our day now, if you have a teenage daughter, you have to open the phones and have a conversation. And you need to do it in the next 24 or 48 hours and sit down and talk about your mind is so precious and you are so precious. And the kind of addictions and the kind of information and the kind of attacks, no one would take their 12 or 13 or 11 year old daughter or son or 10 year old boy and drop them off, you know, like in downtown San Jose in the middle of the night or downtown Oakland and go, hey, I'll catch you later, have fun. And yet when you don't have filters, when you don't have a conversation, when you haven't talked about these things, it's exactly what you're doing. And our kids are dying. Ask yourself, will this cleanse or dirty my soul? And the next word is lovely. I like this one, attractive, winsome, beautiful. It pictures things that call forth a response of love and warmth versus bitterness, criticism, and vengeance. This is a call to smell the roses, to look at a rainbow, to watch kids playing in a park, to ponder a pleasant memory, to pause with a warm embrace, Put your feet up and read an encouraging book. Uh, yesterday, I'm, I'm very excited. I guess it was Friday. I got a chance. I might kind of, those of you that are, haven't been around, I just had this horrendous back issue and I had surgery. And I just, I played golf a couple times. It's so fun. And as I was driving, it was about 6.30 in the morning, all these puffy clouds. And then it was all red and pink behind them. And I was just driving and it was just like winsome, attractive. Admirable, Oh, Lord. And I happened to my phone, you know, you know how these phones work where they just play songs that are on your phone. You never know which is coming up. And out of the blue comes up a song from a 25-year-old young man who's best friends with my son. And he died of cancer at 25. And the song came on, Restore Me. And I thought back of those memories and I thought back of what God has done. And it was just, I just began to ponder his kindness and his sovereignty and his love and beauty and creation. Guess what, guess what happened to my emotions? When's, I mean, we live close to the ocean. When's the last time you went there? When's the last time you went to the redwoods? Get your faces out of the screens and look at the beauty that God has brought. Ask yourself this question. 
Will this renew or harden my heart? Uh, again, I, we're all different. I'm really sensitive. I mean, super sensitive to information. But I, uh, I wrote in the little VCC Weekly, I had come home and uh, we were going to eat, eat in about 10 minutes and, you know, I don't know what kind of habit. It was Channel 2 and I looked on Channel 2 and it was like, oh my gosh, you know, someone was killed in Oakland. And then after that, you know, there's like 12 or 13 kids abused and chained and starved. And I thought, man, I can't handle that. So I went to Channel 4 and, you know, got to Channel 4 and, I mean, it was like, oh my, this ugly racism things that happen. And then, you know, oh my gosh, that was so negative. I thought, you know, PBS, sometimes they'll give you a more documentary sort of position. All I wanted was to get a little update on the day, and they're showing an earthquake in another country and rescue workers and dogs and pulling bodies out of, <laughs> you know, in 10 minutes. And I sat down to eat, and it was just like, Ugh. I found myself disturbed within, sad, angry about the injustice in the world, a sense that the world is completely messed up. Here's, here's the deal. In 10 minutes, in 10 minutes, Everything bad that happened in the globe went on my screen and to me. And I'm telling you, there were hundreds of millions of acts of kindness and children born and people being generous and love given and people caring and kids adopted and food given and fresh water and people pulled out of the sex trade and all that wonderfulness I didn't see. All I got in 10 minutes was that and it shaped my thinking. And my emotions did exactly what they're supposed to do. So I don't watch the news. I don't. I mean, the names change. It's all the same stuff. Now, you, oh, I gotta stay up on things. I walk in each morning, get a cup of coffee. I read the highlights of the Wall Street Journal. I read the highlights of the San Jose, whatever it is. And um, if something really big happens, you know, you get those feeds on your phone. I don't read them. Oh, then everyone starts talking about something. I feel, this must be a big one. And I'll read it and find out what's going on. What you allow in your mind the last 30 to 45 minutes before you go to bed and what you allow in your mind the first 30 minutes of your day will shape your subconscious, your mind, your thinking. You're either starving fear and feeding faith or you're doing the opposite. Finally, he says that which is commendable, good report, repute. He says gracious, admirable is the meaning of the word. It literally means Fair speaking, it describes things which are fit for God to hear versus ugly words, false words, and pure words. And the test here is, could I recommend this to someone who looks up to me? Right? Now, you don't, but by the way, if you kind of are thinking, oh my gosh, this would radically change what comes in my house, good. <laughs> It'll also change your fear, change your emotions, change your kids if you have them. But... You don't, you don't have to raise your hands on this one. Have you ever been watching something and someone's coming down the hall and, and before they walk in, you change the channel? Oh, okay. I, I did that once. We've all been watching something and a little kid is coming in or your mate's coming in or something. And I don't mean that it's terrible, but you just, I'm not comfortable with them watching this. How about this test? Imagine you're sitting on, you know, one of those couches with two or three seats, and whatever's coming on your phone, your screen, your TV, the Lord Jesus in his resurrected body shows up and says, hey, Chip, how you doing? Great. I'm just going to relax a little bit and watch this. Great. Mind if I sit down? No, I'd love to have you. Here's the question to ask. Are you comfortable with him sitting next to you watching what you're watching? Are you comfortable with a five-year-old? with a grandchild? Are you comfortable with someone in this church or that you know that they just look up to you and you think, man, how, if they think I'm the best Christian, boy, oh boy, we're in trouble, but they do. Can you recommend it to them? And if you can't recommend it to them, it's not good for you. Our kids sometimes speak with just great, great wisdom. And this is something that when some of you were parents, you uh, said to your kids, and the way the world has changed, this is what our kids need to say to us. Watch this. Let's give those kids a hand, isn't it great? Did, did you listen to the words, though? The words were not, the father up above is really down on you. Clean your act up, you scumbag, right now. <laughs> That's how some of you feel. The father up above He's looking down in love. 
when I put things in my mind that separate me from my father who paid the price and, and let the son shed his blood for me, who so longs for my relationships and my purposes and my life to be filled with joy and goodness. When he sees that, the father up above, he's looking down in love. He's not down on you. It is the shame that you feel that will keep you from acting. We have men's groups if you need help with pornography. We have women who are married to men who struggle with pornography. And for a lot of us, this is just a topic that in your small groups and with a close friend or two, you just need to say, I heard that message and this is some areas I need to work on. Would you help me? Would you help me keep my commitments? He loves me and I, I live a fearful life. The, the levels of depression in America are, are catastrophic. And much of it is because of what we think about. He finally summarizes and said, if there's any virtue or praise, in other words, in case I left anything out, it's sort of a think on anything that has the moral excellence and that will inspire and motivate you to love God and to love others. So everything doesn't have to be spiritual. I'm listening to a book called The, the Last Line. It's the, it's the life of Winston Churchill. It's just, it's fabulously interesting. So in my car, I mean, it's, it's a book like this. That's why I put it on Audible. I said, I'll never read that. I've got like six hours in, and I looked the other day, there's only 31 hours left. But I mean, his courage and what was happening in the war, and I'm listening to another book by John Ortberg on the life you've always wanted. And at night before I go to bed, and you know, it's just 10, 15, 20, 30 minutes, I'm, I'm reading about the life of Martin Luther, and just, just all I want to do is, how do I, Lord, how do I fill my life and my mind with good things? Because I will be the product of my thought life. But it's just not thinking, it's then acting. Habitually practice these things. Habitually practice these things. He says, you, you've learned and received. You had an appetite and you applied. You heard and saw, I gave instruction and I modeled it. And here's why, your thought life determines your, write the word future. I don't know what your hopes are, but I'm gonna tell you, your future will be determined by your thought life. The dreams the passions, the joys, the thoughts for friends, for family, for work. The scripture in Romans chapter eight, I put it in the Amplified because it's so graphic. Here's a great truth, follow along. For those who are living according to the flesh set their minds, notice the phrase, on the things of the flesh, which gratify the body. But those who are living according to the spirit set their minds on the things of the spirit his will and his purpose. Now the mind on the flesh is death, both now and forever, because it pursues sin. But the mind of the spirit is life and peace, the spiritual well-being that comes from walking with God. Both now and forever. The mind of the flesh with its sinful pursuits is actively hostile to God. It doesn't submit itself to God's law since it cannot. And those who are in the flesh, living a life that caters to sinful appetites and impulses, notice, cannot please God. You can't keep putting things in your mind and then in your will, oh God, I wanna do this. Transformation always begins with your thinking. Second how, it's the principle of mind renewal. The principle of mind renewal. It's a verse we hear a lot around here, Romans chapter 12 too, and I like this again in the Amplified Bible. And do not be conformed to this world any longer with its superficial values and customs, but be transformed, and notice, not overnight, progressively changed as you mature spiritually by the renewing of your mind. Sometimes in some of these illustrations, they sort of, they kind of get me because I'm getting old-er. Uh, I've been a Christian a little over 40 years. I didn't grow up as a Christian. I'm still doing the most basic things that I did years ago because I'm still struggling with everything that I'm talking to you about. But what I can tell you is, as I have done what I've talked about, the transformation that I've seen God in my life and those I love and those I've had the chance to help. So I have a little card, you can make your own. Before I watch, listen, or think on it, is it true? Does it honor God? Is it right or wrong? 
Will this cleanse or dirty my soul? Will this renew or harm my heart? Would I recommend this to someone who looks up to me? Will this bring peace or fear in my life? When I went through this stuff with my back, I had a time to really ponder some big issues and look at some pretty big holes that I felt God was speaking to me. And so I, 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 there was a lie. I've always been, you know, semi-ADD, you know, A-type personality, you know, all those things. It's, it's why I love it here. I'm among friends. <laughs> You're over the top. When I go to Korea, it's like, whoa, they're more, they're more like this than I am. I love it. I just hang out with them. You know, it's just wonderful. And, um, but here's, what I, here's a lie I've believed most of my life. I'm a prisoner of the opinions of the important, influential people in my life. I agonize when my best judgment and direction from the Lord is different from theirs. Disagreeing with them will harm our relationship irreparably. So I attempt to please everyone, creating an unhealthy lifestyle. I mean, you could say it a lot easier, like people pleasing. But part of that is an alcoholic father and realizing, you know, you got to keep the peace, and so you learn clues. And, and so that's, that's on one side of a card, and it says, lie, I believe. Then I flip the card over, and it says, truths. Here's the truth. People love me and are for me and want me to live a life of joy, rhythm, rest, and fruitfulness in all areas of my life. I do not need to prove my worth through hard work or extraordinary productivity. I'm accepted, loved, and greatly valued just for who I am. But that lie pops up. So guess what I do? I read this side of the card and then I say, stop. And then I turn it over and I read this side of the card. And you know what I do? I'm setting my mind on the spirit. What lies do you believe? What cards do you need to make? You would just be shocked at what God will do as you renew your mind. As you turn the page, here's the promise. The God of peace, the God of shalom will be with you. It's not just you're going to receive his peace, but his blessing, his power, his presence, his provision. He he wants to fulfill the desires of your heart. Are you ready for this? Here's the biggest lie you believe. You don't think God is for you. You think you got to measure up. He is so outlandishly for you. In, in the New Living Bible, Psalm 86, about verse 5 says, it says, oh, Lord, you are so good, so ready to forgive, so abounding in unfailing love to all who ask for your help. And I bet I've read that hundreds of times in the last probably 90 days because I read that and I just getting it from here to here for me is I just have this predisposition and I know where it came from is that God's arms are probably kind of a little bit crossed and now and then his toes tapping and no matter what I do well Chip that wasn't quite good enough here's what you need to do and that's a lie and I'm changing and you can change and your kids need to change but you you will have to guard your mind like never before. Remember, we started, I asked you a question. Do you want to overcome your fear? Do you? I mean, I mean, for real, I want you to go back to, this is what I was afraid of. Do you want to overcome your fear? If you do, then you have to radically change. These things don't come into my house, they don't come into my mind, they don't come on my screen, they don't come on my phone, and they don't come into my kids' or grandkids' lives. This truth is going to start into my mind. I've given you a game plan, 21 minutes of how to spend time with God. That's a good start. It's written out for you. I am so excited that as you take these steps, God will show up in your life like never before. Now, here's the deal. Your emotions aren't gonna change overnight. But if you do what we're talking about, I mean, a week, you'll go, hmm, a little different. A couple, three weeks, whoa, a little different. About 30 days, it'll be like, wow. 90 days, people will say, what happened to you? Six months, two years? Those addictions, those anger issues, those I've got to measure up, those things can really change.